Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello, lovely. How are you? Oh, hello. I don't know why it was taking a little bit for me to get on. Um, oh. I had to log in under Jen and it was under my name, so it wasn't working out. So it's um, this is cool. good. Sick hat. Can you see everything? Yes. Yeah, I can see. Yeah. Yay. Um, sweet. Cool. All right. Well, I'm just going to start. There's only one person in the waiting room right now. Well, there's still one minute, but you know, um, <laughs> do you need anything before I let people in? No, you can rip it. Cool. I will adjust if need be. <laughs> okay, cool. Hello, Macy. What'd you do today, Hannah? I worked. Yeah. <laughs> My apartment is really, really small and we have a lot of bikes. So to set up so that I could show you how to do these things inside, I had to rearrange a lot. Nice. Well, I'm glad that you did so we can see. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, pretty fun. Like this is the nice part, but since y'all are here, I'll show you like right next to me, there's like three extra bikes. Oh and if you like look in the back room, uh, there's more bikes back there. It's, it's a problem. So uh, yeah, it is what it bikes is. Bikes. <laughs> but it's bikes and people. And I apologize if the camera gets knocked over at any point. It's definitely my cat, one of them. <laughs> he, as soon as I said that, he just jumped up on the table where the camera is. I don't trust that. Cat. There's the dogs, the cats, it's <laughs> but oh, I was going to go outside and then there's landscapers in my home now. So I think that could be a little loud. <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of hot outside. So I'm not yeah, what is it? What's the temp there right now? It's a great question. I think it's, but it's just getting warmer. It's pretty, I, it's so windy here lately. Like mm. we were laying out by the river and like when the sun was out, it was really nice. And then the wind would come in and it was cold. Like, great. It's June. I know I want to float the river soon, but it's like been so high that I'm like, is it safe to float the river? But then if you wait too long and it gets too low, then you're just like dragging your ass. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, it's that tight window. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to same, same here. Oh, Nia. Hello. Well, we'll give it a few more minutes. Um, I said and... <laughs> what? I said it's a Thursday. People are busy, so. Yeah, and the re I'll post the recording of this as well. Um, because some people end up, you know wanting to just watch the recording. Yeah, I definitely typed out like half of this in very coherent notes that could just be like read. And then the other half of it is written on a notepad and is significantly less coherent. Um, but I could definitely transcribe it into something if you guys want to like publish something written about it too. Um, I pretty much have already written most of this down at some point in time. So let me know. Okay. Yeah. Good. Cool. So. Well, do you want to get started? And then if more people start coming in, I'll just admit them. Because that's sure. happened with that country beta too, that some people just end up coming in like a bit later, you know. To every single back country beta clinic I went to. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I forget it's happening. Oh my 
shit, shit, shit. And then I'm like trying to get on and I'm like, make sure my camera's off and stuff. Cause I'm obviously multitasking. If I forgot, it's, it's embarrassing. So, um, so we, well, I'm going to start off with the cocktail. That's good. Um, because I think that bikes are enjoyed best when you're working on them with alcohol for multiple reasons. One of them that bikes can sometimes hurt your feelings when you're working on them and the alcohol makes it better. So I pre-measured everything and I make my drinks in a very, um, humble way. It's, we're not very fancy over here. So the drink I'm making, if you want to make it at home ever is called a Brown Derby and it's a whiskey drink and it's citrusy. So I like it in the summer when it's warm. So it's like one and a half ounces of bourbon and then half an ounce of honey syrup. I have just used maple syrup in the past and it's kind of good or honey that I watered down a little bit. If you don't have fancy like honey honey syrup and then one ounce of grapefruit juice you can make it fresh or you cannot because it doesn't matter it's going to taste good either way oh that's a nice way to have a shaker without having a shaker <laughs> yeah. yeah so uh i am you know all about that uh sustainability so i just use old pickle jars Ooh. and then use the lid as my strainer and then you have nice. a nice cocktail. Nice super easy. And delicious. Okay. And then you just wash it, you keep using it. It's good for the environment. I like so, that. Yeah, that's uh my summer bike drink. So um for starters, I guess I should have actually introduced myself. Uh if you don't know who I am, my name's Hannah. I'm a Coalition Snow Ambassador. Um before I was an ambassador, I worked for Coalition for many years. So if you bought skis a couple of years ago, I was likely who shipped them. If you sent an email, I'm who answered it. And I, it was such a pleasure working for Coalition that I stuck around for the party and it's awesome and we love it. Um, and although at the time I definitely identified mostly as a skier, uh, I started biking in my off season due to some running injuries and in my not being able to run more and climb as much and uh, a couple years later i have seven bikes that i personally own <laughs> and i race almost all disciplines of bikes um just for fun but ultimately like i also like to ride my bike to the river and hanging out because bikes are so cool and i think are just like such a tool for freedom i think it was um i'm gonna totally butcher this but there's a quote from a very famous feminist in history, and I'm going to butcher it, but it's definitely in one of the Sisu magazines. So if you read Sisu, you can find it there. Um, but uh, I think it was Susan B. Anthony said that the bicycle was like, um, did like more for the emancipation of women than a lot of things or something along those lines to paraphrase. And I totally think it's great. I've gone through lots of times in my life where I solely commuted on bicycles. And I think that it's a great way to stay in shape for for, for ski season and just a good way to get around and to explore and see really cool places. I've met more cool people and seen more cool things on my bikes and my skis than I think most people see in their lifetime. So that's what's really awesome and cool about it. Um, so my topics that I was gonna cover today were just a pre-ride safety check that would apply to all bikes. Um, and then I was going to kind of see who is here and what would be the most beneficial to talk over. So I'm prepared to talk on um, some high level suspension setup for mountain bikes. And then um, uh, also just how to fix a flat if that would be beneficial. But I also don't wanna be super redundant. And if everyone here is like, I can change a flat tire, Hannah, I'm good. Then we can just go <laughs> over the other stuff or we can just kind of Q and A it. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm you know pretty good at working on my bikes but there's always stuff that you don't know. So I'll answer as much as I can. And, you know, that's why bike shops exist is if you can't do it, someone else can. <laughs> so, um, cool. Any questions yeah. there? I feel like, um, Nia and Macy, if either you, because it is a small group, like if there's anything specifically that you want to go over, you have a, a question you can, pop it in the chat or just unmute yourself um, if you want. Um, yeah, and then we can kind of go from there. I'm cool. making sure while I'm listening, but 
that's why I don't have the video on. <laughs> there is important. Girls got to eat. Yes. So <laughs> sweet. Um, well, free ride safety check. Um, to be honest, I used to not do all of these things because I thought that like I like had a really good idea of how my bike was always running. And then when I made like a commitment to myself to check all of these things every time before I rode, um, it was eye opening <laughs> to me. Um, just like uh all of the things that it's good to check before you ride your bike so i have my mountain bike right here and i hope everybody can see it um the first thing that you always want to check when you are going to go for a bike ride is to check your tire pressure um at the minimum go ahead and reach down and like give each tire a good squeeze um if you ride like a lot you might kind of know how your tires feel but you definitely like shouldn't be able to squish it a whole bunch. And ultimately a hand test is not very accurate. If you can pull out your bike pump and check your tire pressure, it's always the best thing to do. Um, it sometimes it seems like annoying or like a, a total time suck to um, open my notes just went away because I didn't, I didn't touch them for too long. Um, <laughs> but uh, cause it's just like checking your tires is boring, but especially on mountain biking, I think that like tire pressure and having it really dialed down how you like your setup, it makes like one of the most impactful dif differences on like how well I'm able to ride in certain terrain, especially if it's super loose or if you're riding on like long rock slabs or stuff like that. Um, the more you have it set up well, the safer it is and the better traction you're going to have. And it would totally suck to be like caught out on your way to work or something with a flat tire. So, um, for mountain biking, if I'm my setup currently, I run 29 inch wheels front and rear, and I run a tubeless setup. So there's no tube, but there's just like sealant in my system. And I generally at, at roughly around like a buck 55 kitted up. Um, I usually run like 24 PSI in my front tire and 22 PSI in my rear tire. Um, this is all dependent on preference and tires, um, but there's lots of good calculators out there if you're running a tubeless setup. And then if you don't know, if you're not running a mountain bike or you don't know your wheel size or anything, um, most wheels and tires will have what the recommended PSI is printed somewhere on the side of the tire here. So this is like a road bike wheel, but um, it'll tell you what the min and max um, pressure for that is. And then You'll just want to make sure that you grab a bike pump that has one of these nice little gauges on it so that you can make sure, you know, to have something sort of accurate. Um, all pumps vary a little bit, to be honest, so it might not be 100% accurate, but if you're always using the same pump, it'll be really consistent. Um, and so, yeah, just always make sure you're using the recommended PSI. The next thing that I always check is axles and quick releases. So basically the little thing that's holding both of your wheels in. On most like super modern mountain bikes, you're going to need a multi-tool to do this. So I like this one. It's like a Crank Brothers one and it has just about every tool I could ever need. So, um, and it's like not the most expensive tool out there. Uh, it's not super cheap, but I like it because it's not going to strip your bolts, but it'll do the trick. Um, so before I ride, it's really good. Your axles can work themselves out. Um, quick releases can lose tension. There's like a lot of things that can happen regardless of even if it was fine the last time you just ride it. So I always, you know, reach down, like give it a little tightness check, make sure it's good to go. You can visually inspect it too. Um, but I have had my axles walk out on me while riding and it's a very scary <laughs> experience. So you want to make sure you always check that. Um, and know what kind of tools you need to uh, tighten your axles if needed. If you have a quick release bike, you might not need any tools to tighten your axles. Um, but if you do not, if you have what's called a through axle, um, you might need to have a multi-tool like this to even fix a flat on the trail. So make sure you have the right tool for that um, and check your axles. The next thing you wanna check is your brakes, which might seem like- Anna, self can I ask a question real quick? Yes, totally. What's a quick release? <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I totally missed that. So, um, a quick release is. I honestly, on this bike, I have no idea. 
<laughs> you can send me a picture of your bike later too but um so basically if like when you take your wheel out of your bike if uh -huh. there's like an axle that goes all the way through like there's a knob on each side and that you can see maybe kind of like something a little springy and then there's like a lever mm -hmm. that's what's called a quick release um and Got it. They're, they're more common on road bikes and older mountain bikes though definitely still use them i have an older mountain bike Mine might be that because it's kind of old and i don't think <laughs> it's true um but those are really easy um you can just kind of like open it and then reclose it and make sure it seems tight in there and you're good but if it undoes itself you actually have to hold one of the other sides and then turn it in a little bit and then you'll it'll compress into itself when you push the lever back down um so it's easy to check got but, it okay um with those also because there's so when there's a through axle you'll just have like a circle on the end of like your fork or your rear triangle and it like you'll have like a bolt that essentially goes all the way through on like a a, a through axle but if you have this other type it's going to be like completely open at the end of your fork and your dropout so you also want to like eyeball it and make sure that it's fully in the frame because it could in theory walk itself out it's not very common but it's something worth checking which is why it's just like give it a little look see Lou before you go for a ride make sure you're <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know um so that's like you always check your check your axles and your quick release if you have a quick release instead pretty much check that your wheels are truly fixed the bike the way that they should be um are there any other questions sorry i don't want to go too fast and talk too much it's my my go to <laughs> <laughs> I feel like if other people, because it is a small group, have questions, just un I think you're able to unmute yourself and just yeah, just shout at me. Ask that that works really yeah. well for me. Um the way I like to check my brakes really quickly, like just before I leave the house, because like it would it's so bad if you like get to the trailhead and then you realize that one of your brakes not working. But um on a flat bar bike, you obviously have like these kind of brakes um on drop bar you'll pull them the other way but usually I just start, grab like one of the brakes and I try to push the bike forward I make sure that it's fully grabbing if I can like push the bike through and I see the wheel like moving even though I have the brake fully compressed that's like a red flag to me um so I'll do it on both of them and like your bike might drag but like ultimately you shouldn't be able to like pull it through um if you have it fully compressed and just make sure you're also not pulling your brakes all the way to the bar or to where it would like smash your fingers or something while you're riding um if so it probably just needs a brake lead but probably not best to go send it down the gnarliest trail in your area <laughs> that day <laughs> probably best to give them a bleed first um because there's nothing worse than being um caught out with not fully functioning brakes um so yeah i just grab push it stopped grab push we should be good to go on that so it's it should be ready to rock and roll as far as brakes um this one is maybe like a little less common that people don't think to check a lot but um you'd be surprised how often you find out about issues um when when you check this um and that is that you should check your wheels so you already checked your axles so they should be you know in the frame correctly and everything at this point um, but after that, I like to check my wheels. I usually just grab my handlebars a little bit and I try to like move the wheel side to side. There's bearings and mechanisms in the hub that holds your wheel together. And those things can sometimes need to be serviced or have issues. And so you can have play in your wheel even if you have everything else set up on your bike, right? So it's good to just give the wheel a good wiggle back and forth um, because when those fail, it can be a little catastrophic and not ideal. So just usually pick up the bike, wiggle the wheel a bit side to side. You know, you can flip the bike upside down and spin your wheels. Make sure nothing's like whomping too far to the side. That could just mean you need to take your wheels in to be trued and serviced. Um, but it's really good to check that because those bearings wear down over time and need servicing um, and they can be sticking or holding up in certain ways. So um, that's another thing that I like to do. That's my fourth check. So we're going to check our tires, our axles, our brakes, and our wheels. 
And then everything on the bike likes to develop play slowly over time. So just like our wheels, we're gonna check for um, lateral play. We're gonna do the same thing with the cranks, which is what your wheels attach to and your pedals. So I like to grab the crank and pull it side to side. It honestly, like, like towards me and then back towards the bike, it honestly should not have any play at all. Um, if it does have play, these can get loose. Your crank arms can get loose. And on some crank sets, it's really easy to grab like one to one tighten it down. Some are more complicated. So if you're confident in fixing that yourself, awesome. If not, swing by your local bike shop on your way to the ride. It should be a quick fix for them that they could easily help you with. Um, like just walk out and a couple steps, um, but still super valid. Same thing with your pedals. They have a spindle in them. So you just wanna like wiggle them. Um, you don't want play in your spindles. Um, your, your spindles can collapse or break, which would be really sucky if you were very far away. Wow, that's so annoying. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't, Sorry, I can't talking. hear it. Okay, good. I can't hear they're, it. they're like leaf blowing directly outside my door. <laughs> I can't hear it. Oh, that's good. Cool. Awesome. So we're going to check our crank arms and our pedals. Um, and then it's distracting. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to check. Uh, we're going to have a breakdown. Second. It's the dogs at the door. Okay. Sorry. And then your sixth thing you wanna check. Oh man, they need to tell me next time they're doing this. Um, I definitely think it sounds louder to you. I can barely that's hear it. Great. Yeah. I don't, the next I don't thing you wanna check is gonna be your bars, your stem and your headset. Um, so I'm going to move my bike closer to show you guys this one because I think that this is one of the most important ones. It can make your bike feel really weird and like not super trustworthy um, when you're riding it, especially on your mountain bike. So um, it's really easy to tell if your stem is loose. If you stand over the bike like this, you know, and like not yarding it because you should have some play. Um, like if you were to put crash really hard, you might have your bars turn or something like that. That's intentional. Uh, it keeps your equipment from breaking and you from breaking if there is play and a substantial impact. But you shouldn't be able to like gently hold the wheel in place between your knees and like push your bars side to side um, and have them move. They should stay fixed as they are. So that this way I know that my my stem is good to go. And then the way that you check your headset, which your headset is these connectors that um, basically are the interface between the fork of your bike and then the main frame. Um, you're gonna grab the front brake and then you're gonna push the bike forward and backwards. And you can feel if there's play in the headset, you can put your hand like on this. You'll be able to feel gentle movement and like sometimes even clicking noises if there's play and it basically just means that not everything is synced together and tightened down and there's some extra wiggling going on in here that you don't want to happen. Um, so that is the other thing that you wanted to check for all purpose of safety and goodness because um, it's good to steer. And then the last thing I do because I always just like to end with this and remember to wax or, or lube my chain anyways, is I'll do like a quick chain inspection. I will just like run it through my derailleur really quick. Make sure that no part of the chain looks like bent or kinks. If your chain's super rusty, you would probably want to replace it. Um, ultimately, like even if it is rusty, you could probably ride it to the shop or go for a quick ride, but like you wouldn't want to do that long term. You always want your chain to be clean if possible and um, lubricated. So um, to lube your chain, uh, there's lots of different kinds of lubes out there. So it kind of depends on what you're using, but most of them you can get at any local bike shop. You're just gonna wanna have a rag and you're gonna apply a drop of it to every single little leak if you can. Um, so you'll just push through all your gears very slowly, lubricating all of the little links of your chain 
and then give it like three or four really big spins. And then you'll wipe it down with the rag so that there's not excess on there because the excess will just collect mud and it'll be gross and not super great. There are two screws loose on some part of my bike. I don't think they should be loose. <laughs> Nice. I was just like looking at a part of my bike and I was like, hmm, those screws are loose. I'm going to tighten those. Where are there loose screws, Evan? Let me show, show you because I show don't us. really, yeah, I don't know a lot of bike things. I don't That's know true. if you're going to be able to see this. Um, are they, do you see this? Okay. Those are not loose. Don't tighten them. Oh, okay. That's good. I was about to tighten them. They this could is be good. Loose. Thanks for they talking. could be loose. Um, but so this is a great topic. See, these are things I didn't even think about. So on your your bike has a front derailleur. On a, any derailleur, front or rear, you're gonna have two screws that are your limit screws. So you you're be, just because basically not all bikes have the exact same like spacing and limits and everything and a different wheel or a different hub like they all make a difference in like the really minute spacing in between things your derailleur set up so that you can basically set limits like it can't shift past a certain point and that's what those screws do so like the more you screw it in the tighter your limits are and the more you screw it out the farther your limits are so if you were to tighten it super tight you might be like why can't i shift suddenly <laughs> Um, and it would just be because it's basically blocking the derailleur from moving past that point. Um, it's good to like check all of those little bolts on your derailleurs and such um, because they can loosen up and they ca can cause um, issues over time. If you're not confident adjusting them to make sure they're in the right place, I would just take it to a bike shop. But I would honestly just make sure that they're not like so loose they're about to fall out. Like I'd give them a little hand jiggle, see how they feel as 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 long as they're in there, you should be good to go. Yeah, I think they're in there. They just it felt like I could move around the piece that they're in more so, I guess. And gotcha. they're like sticking up a little. So I was like, uh-oh. Yeah, let me show you. Sorry, we're doing real hands-on here. Um, so like, for example, this bike doesn't have a front derailleur. It only has a rear derailleur. But this screw that you can see right here, you if you didn't know better, you might be like, wow, Hannah, that screw looks loose. You're not supposed to have it all backed out like this. Got it. But in all reality, that's my limit screw. And it's set up currently right because I'm not shifting on or off and I have access to all of my gears. So you wouldn't want to adjust that. <laughs> um, so it. these little ones that are on either your front or rear derailleur, you wouldn't want to have one of those loose for sure. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, if it's like loosey goosey or super wiggly, it might be worth just, yeah, take it to the shop and be like, Hey, like, this is weird. Can you take a peek? And they'll probably point you one way or another, but there's some that should look like that. Um, but that could definitely be confusing. You can see all my notes. This is really behind the scenes here, guys. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh cool. Did you have any other questions? How to loop your chain, any of the, that good stuff. You said use a cloth. Yeah, I'd use a rag. So you put a bunch of lube on the chain and then yeah. I use a little rag. I should have grabbed this and put it out. One second. I have, but I, I'm on it. So I just have like a rag like this and then okay. you have chain lube like comes in like a little bottle like this. And uh, you would just like drop it on the chain. This actually isn't chain loop, but that's funny. It's the same kind of bottle that my chain loop comes in. <laughs> You're just gonna drip it along the chain. Like if I scrub, scoot down here. So um, I like to flip my bike upside down to do this, um, but you don't have to. It's just your pedals will get in the way. So you would just drip it along the little chain and kind of roll through it like this. And then once you've done that and you've gone through the entirety of the chain, I just hold onto the chain lightly with the rag and wipe off anything excess that's on there so it doesn't get chunky and gross. Cool. 
Um, but yeah, so that's like your seven points safe to check before you go for a ride. Obviously parts can still break and things don't always work out, but I've had like a much higher percentage of rides without issues since I started doing that. And I do that before like every ride I go on. Gravel, road, mountain biking, a chill commute on my single speed, like really any, any kind of bike rides. I think it's super beneficial. And I think it's like really easy to just like be gung ho to get out the door and can be frustrating when you yeah. end up having issues. Yeah. So that was that. Cool. Um, and then I have, we can fix a flat together or we can talk about suspension, which I feel like might bleed into like a larger conversation. Um, but whatever the crowd is feeling or if anybody has any other questions, I just was thinking of like the general ones that people ask a lot about more frequently, but I will do my best to answer whatever. I kind of wanted to keep it free form and fun. Yeah. Um, Nia or Macy, do either of you have um, a specific question or direction that um, you would like Hannah to go in? I have a question. So okay. I'm like new to bikes kind of. Um, I am a downhill bike park instructor this summer. And every now and then my supervisor will be like, okay, you guys, make sure you're doing a bolt check. Are there mm -hmm. any other bolts that you didn't mention that are like pretty important to check? Totally. It obviously depends on your bike. Um, you're probably on like a downhill bike from your bike park for work, I'm assuming, because um, they do those. Check, I, I, I'm gonna say all of them, but check all of them. Here, one second, I'm turning the camera around again. So I think what's really important, especially on full suspension bikes is, and my, this bike is completely battered, so uh, bear with me, but your pivot points can get loose. Even the par parts that your like suspension is attached to. So I, axles are the most important. Those are what are most likely to walk out on their own, but I've seen different pivot point ones back out. Um, so I double check those. I double check my water bottle cage pretty regularly just because those loosen up all the time and you'll just lose bottles and it's just annoying. <laughs> it's not per se dangerous, but it's pretty annoying to lose bottles. Um, I just give my saddle like a good shake and make sure the clamps on well. Um, sometimes those will still have a little play, but like these points right here, it's always good just to make sure that like everything seems secure. Like sometimes I'll just like flex the shock, make sure that it's in place. Um, and then your derailleur hanger comes loose. Uh, that's another one that can come loose. So there's it can like- come loose and bend. That's what yes. I did to mine. <laughs> so, uh, so while we're down here, <laughs> I just like popped a squat. Like some of these, obviously you don't want to, um, like I was pointing out the limit screws. You don't want to tighten those down because it's not good for those to all be like crazy tight. But like this one right here, this is where your derailleur actually attaches to the hanger itself. Um, you want to make sure that that's always tight. Like give it a little wiggle. Like this has play in the cage, but like obviously not in the derailleur itself. Um, your Kate or your hanger can bend. There's a kind of expensive niche tool to bend it back. Or personally, if you like to do really big rides, if you're mostly riding the park, like it's not that big of a deal. You can just get back down to the bottom and then go get a new, uh, hanger at your bike shop. Or if they don't have the one you need, like order it. But if you like to pedal really far or go on big, like anywhere in like you're out in the woods, this this piece is de designed to break um, in case of, because your derailleur itself is much more expensive than this piece. So that's the concept behind it. Um, it's also that like not all bike manufacturers had a universal standard for how it mounts to the frame, but the mounting point itself is uh, universal. So most bikes have hangers. There is like a new, drivetrain that doesn't utilize these it's like brand new it's very expensive <laughs> and it's really nice but uh, most most bikes utilize these I carry a spare hanger in my bum bag they're like that big 
and not very heavy um, if I'm going on a long ride. But you would want to make sure this is tight and secure. Want to make sure your derailleur is tight and secure. And then just every once in a while, especially bike parts, just rip through bikes. Like they really, it's amazing because you get to ride so much like tough terrain and stuff. But I always joke that like about going to North Star because um, I'm in the Reno Tahoe area and just being like, what am I going to break today? And like, it's very rare. I don't break <laughs> something on my bike. Um, but also my bike is uh, a little bit more like trail pedal oriented. It's not a full downhill bike. So it's also just like quite a bit of impact for it to take. Um, but that's, I would check all of your bolts, check your stem bolts, um, which would be, you know, just like these bad boys. I always give like my brakes and my shifters a couple taps. Again, those are ones that you want to keep like a little loose because you want them to move if you crash so that you don't like break your wrist, but you don't want them to like move when you're not crashing. So <laughs> it's like a delicate balance on that one, um, so to speak. I never thought about bringing one of those, but that would definitely come in handy if you needed it. <laughs> yeah, it like, so I um, got my, I was, I've like been a commuter for years, but uh, really into commuting on bikes and everything. But I actually didn't get into mountain biking until like the pandemic year, really. And you couldn't get things then. And I broke a derailleur really early on. And so then I like kind of was like panicked about not being able to purchase another hanger if something happened. So I just bought some backups. And then I was like, if I have this, why wouldn't I just bring it with me? You know, yeah. um, especially cause we have just like such great like trail systems and stuff over here. Like, you know, like we can go out, we've got Downeyville, we have North Star and we have everything in Tahoe, you can go on like some pretty decent sized rides where you'd be really far from a car or help. And like, not that it should be a scary thing, but like, if it's not going to be a detriment for you to carry it, like, why not? I'm kind of an over prepare. Um, but I always, I always carry usually like an extra hanger, um, a multi-tool. I don't always carry like two tire levers, but I at least always carry one. Just kind of depends if I know if my tires are really hard to get on and off or not. <laughs> if I'm going to have an issue, I always carry one tube. If it's like a race or something where I will be like rural and not around people, sometimes I'll even bring a second tube. Um, what else do I bring? I bring food, snacks. People don't eat enough snacks when they ride their bikes. I wish Most important. Or more snacks, more ride snacks. <laughs> um, fuel is so important, but not mechanically related to the bike. Um, what what else do I have in here? A tube. Can you point, Anna? Can you point at the hanger thing again? I don't think I see that on my bike. Can you point at it on your bike? I'm yes. trying to find it. <laughs> Like, I don't know what this is. It's kind of hard to see because it looks like it's just a part of the derailleur. Okay, were you talking here. about the Eagle transmission derailleur earlier? The yeah, I one? did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Have you experienced that? I heard it's awesome. Um, yeah. It it's kind of a bitch to set up. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, so for my day job, I work for, um, Fox factory, uh, awesome. and we own race face and Easton and most recently ride concepts we purchased, but, um, we make obviously components other than forks, like chain rings and stuff. And it for sure does not like work well with any aftermarket chain ring. Like I wouldn't use, a, I maybe like wolf tooth ones would be good, but like you definitely just want to be on like full transmission drivetrain. You can't like mix and match the way you can with like a lot of others. Um, it is super great and durable. I am very interested to see like what the long-term feedback that comes on it is. Yeah. Um, mostly because if so like your drill your hanger which so on my bike um evan you see these two little um bolts that have the star torques on them these are attached to a little piece under here that you can see a little better from this angle this is separate from this piece so it's just like a little interface 
that connects the this part of my bike to the derailleur itself. Um, gotcha. My thought process behind the new transmission that makes me feel a little scared sometimes is that if the derailleur is not going to break, clearly you have like grown men jumping on them in videos all the time. Um, <laughs> the derailleur is not going to break. There's not a hanger to break. If you impact something hard enough, something's going to break. And I'm worried that it's going to be your rear triangle. Um, because there are a few frame manufacturers that are already like a little notorious for like frames cracking and stuff. I've had like multiple friends uh, crack some specialized frames, some Yeti frames. Like these are bikes that are super awesome that I think are awesome brands, but you know, everything has like a limit of how much it can take. <laughs> and so the new Eagle transmission, super baller, definitely a really cool setup. Um, very hard to set up on your own, very picky. And I just, I probably won't run it on any of my bikes until <laughs> it's been out for like at least a year or two. I'm a second season adopter on gear and products for sure. I feel like the first year you haven't had a large enough test group to know like all of the issues that you're going to have, but that's totally a personal opinion. Um, and my, I have friends who are ripping it and they love it. So I also just, it's a, it's a heavy price point for a drive train. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, and I have lots of bikes, so I'm always like replacing drivetrain parts. So like if it was my one bike, I might consider it more. And I have electronic shifting on other bikes too. And I, I, I'm i really a big fan of it. Uh, I have nothing like against that, but I crash my mountain bike quite a lot. So I just stick, stick to the, stick to what I, what I know, which is good old mechanical eagle. Yeah. <laughs> um. But SRAM all the way. Shimano's okay. I like Shimano too, but SRAM all the way. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> For sure. Uh, I tried electronic shifting on a gravel bike not too long ago, and it is fun. It is so smooth. <laughs> and, now, and I now understand why people like it, but it's yeah. a whole time. I have, um, I have uh, the axis on, I've, I have two gravel bikes. I just built the other one like two days ago. <laughs> um, and I just have like the lowest version, like rival on both of them, mostly because I found a really good deal on my marketplace. But one of them's like a one by setup and one of them's a two by setup. And I really like that you can adjust it while you're riding. Like if you feel like your derailleur starts being funny, you can like hold the button and mess around with it. But it's so it's such a, a mind trip to ride bikes with different drivetrains all the time because I can never remember what paddle does what <laughs> if I'm not really focused mm -hmm. um, as yeah you're used to like flicking and then now it's a button and then one by it's just up and down but two by you have like you have to tap both of them so yeah it's it's quite a lot um, <laughs> all in. yes but um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're good. Um, since we have like close to, I mean, we have like 17 minutes left, 18 minutes left. I guess it's mm -hmm. close to 20 minutes. But um, I just want to see if there's anything specific anyone wants covered. And otherwise, Hannah, I'll let you just like kind of, I guess, most important other important things mm -hmm. that are um good to know how to do on your bike. And if no one else has a question, I can ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a specific question. Um, I'm down to nerd out on suspension if that's what you're going for. That, uh, that was my next step, but Evan, do you have a question sure. for before we dive into suspension? No, that's cool. I know nothing about it, so. <laughs> cool, awesome. <laughs> Um, so suspension, it's amazing. It's terrible. It's complicated. It's all the above. Um, uh, but on your mountain bike, it's really good to just have it set up like within the basic tolerances first. And then as you get more comfortable, as you know, your bike better, you can definitely make some more executive decisions about it. 
Um, but just in general, um, you want to make sure that you own one of these if you own a mountain bike. Um, it's like the one item that I know a lot of mountain bikers don't own that I wish everybody owned. Um, and that's to have your own shock pump. It's different from your tire pump. Um, it's a tire pump. <laughs> look at we're learning new things um so, yeah. so you, can, you can potentially get one of these or you can just go to your local bike shop and have them help you set set it up but i personally like to own one and only use one anytime i adjust my suspension i use this specific bike pump and i always use this one because um like i was talking about earlier like every like reed or, or pump has like a little bit of variation to it um so when you start like nerding out over your suspension and you want to like see if you can add a little more air or make a change to it and see what that change feels like um it's best to always be using like the same point of reference um in case there is variability of course if you're like in a pinch and like there's some sort of extenuating circumstances you can definitely use someone else's pump to like <laughs> pump it up for the day if like for some reason you're feeling like it's way too low and you're out on a ride or something like that but um in general i think everybody should own one of these um it doesn't have to be anything fancy it can be like the most entry level one um that you can find but i think they're very beneficial um and then based on the the way that you kind of want to like get started for a reading if if you bought like a new bike or if you uh, just picked it up from the shop and they didn't set it up for you or anything, um, or if you bought it from someone else. Uh, the most important thing to get set up is going to be your SAG is what it's called. Um, I don't actually know what SAG stands for. I know that it, uh, I'm pretty sure it's just how much the bike SAGs. Um, if it's an acronym, I'm in the dark on that. Um, but your SAG is going to be a measurement of basically how much your um, pieces of suspension compress when you're um, just seated on the bike. So to set up your rear sag, your goal is likely to have it at 25 to 30%. And we'll go over how you would figure that out. Um, but most uh, suspension pieces will have a little O ring around them. Um, it does have a purpose. It's so that you can push it all the way up here to the base of this. And then I'm going to sit on my bike and it's going to compress slightly. So it's important. There is like a little bit of a art to setting up your sag correctly. Um, you definitely, um, it's, it's, I find very helpful if you have someone else with you because they can like sit on your front or like you don't want them to sit on the front tire, but they can hold, stand on the front area and hold the bike stable while you climb onto it. Most importantly, you don't want to like slam your weight onto the bike at any point when you're trying to check sag because then you might not get an accurate reading. So you kind of want to like gently mount your bike and then just like fully weighted and sit on it. You want to like at least for like a moment take both feet off the ground to make sure it compresses all the way. Some people stand up, but I feel like personally when I've been trying to read people's sags, sometimes when you stand up, you accidentally like compress it a little more when you're pushing through um, and you don't always get the most accurate reading. So you just like gently sit on it like I just did and then you can pop off your bike. And depending on whoever manufactures your bike, they usually have a recommended SAG percentage. Um, you can usually just Google like the name of your bike and SAG and find what it is. But most bikes are 30%, some are like 25 my bike, I always run it roughly a 30 sag. Um, right now you can see here. So I just sat on it. I put the ring up, I compressed it. My O-ring is like resting right around that 30% um, line. Um, not all pieces of suspension have those handy numbers, which is a bummer. So in that event, you would unfortunately want to grab a ruler and, and measure the distance and do some quick math um, to see what 30% would be. Um, make sure it's there. If that was, um, if it didn't, if it like went past where the 30 was deep into the 40 or even further, I would add air to this. Um, but because it's sitting right around the 30 mark, um, it's probably good to me. Um, 
my suspension probably needs a service right now, um, which is where you just send it in, have them take it apart and clean it all up basically. Um, but it's still resting at the 30% mark. So that's how you know that it's, it's pretty good to go. Um, if you need to measure it, that's when it's even better to have a second person because sometimes they can measure it for you so that you can know if it's in the right place and you're not getting off the bike, measuring, looking, doing the math and then going, crap, I need to add more air. I need to let air out. If per se, it was gonna be like too stiff, if you sat on it and it was only about like 20% compressed or something, um, you would want to let some air out. That's why it's super handy to have one of these. I would never recommend like going on to the valve port and like trying to stick something in there to let air out of it because you can't really control how much air is lost. But most standard um, shock pumps have a little bleed valve like this one right here. Um, and you can bleed out a little bit of air and make some micro adjustments while this is attached so that you still have the read on what it's currently reading at. And if you don't know where you would make these, where you would attach the pump or haven't really paid attention to that, which is totally valid also. Um, usually your pump should have, and my bike's super dirty, a little like cover right there. I would end up taking this off, hooking it up, and then we'd make the magic happen. But luckily, and much to my surprise, my suspension is still almost set up properly. Um, not that it's not usually, it's just that the last time I rode my bike, I crashed it. So I'm, I wasn't positive it was gonna be right. Um, to set up the sag on your fork, it's a similar process, but you are gonna wanna stand up. So this is again, when it's nice to have someone who can kind of like hold your bars steady for you. But if not, I just kind of usually like go near a wall. Um, another thing that's like really important to remember, and I always forget, is when you're waiting your bike to check your sag, you don't wanna grab your brakes. Um, it changes the way that your bike compresses, especially like when you're checking your rear sag, you wanna definitely avoid your rear brake. And when you're checking your front sags, you definitely want to avoid your front brake. But if you can, I would probably just avoid both. Um, so it's nice to like push your bike into a corner, have someone hold the handlebars for you or something, but not compress them. Or you can like, really gently for your front sag at least, not for your rear shock, like ride your bike like down the street a little bit, but you're pretty much gonna want to uh, stand up on the bike. Wow, I'm gonna miss this one. <laughs> Cause I'm in my living room and don't have a good spot, but you're gonna like stand up on the bike, lean up against something. I need a counter for this, <laughs> but uh, there we go. We'll go like that. So we're gonna stand up on the bike and then you kind of want to like be in a more aggressive position uh, and not tip over but you're going to do the same thing check your o-ring the difference is that for your fork instead of that 25 to 30 percent you're going to want it to be closer to 15 to 20. some people run all the way up to 25. I usually try to run my fork at about 18, um, which you'll see, even though that was really shoddy work um, with my cow couch and my cats in the way. Um, <laughs> uh, that right here, I'm sitting like uh, over here. There we go. I'm sitting just below 20% because I have the numbers. If you don't have them, you would just measure this length and then do some math for that, but that would be like your basic, like how to just make sure your bike doesn't feel super wonky setup. And personally, so that I can get my stuff really dialed and make sure that all my pressures are always right. Once I have it set up to where the sag numbers are correct, both front and rear, I usually like leave, take like a note of how much PSI I put in both rear and front. So if I'm ever feeling like maybe I wish like my bike was more supportive or like it feels super soft. And like, you know, I feel like when I go through Chunder or something like, um, I kind of can manipulate it or like try adding more or less and seeing if I like the feel of that better um, without like losing my baseline. So it's good to like, just write it down somewhere just so you know. Um, and then most modern suspension also has additional 
um, adjustments, you'll have your rebound and your compression. And uh, in case you don't know how those work, essentially like there's like a ton of mechanics inside your fork, but at some point there's like kind of like a middle point where um, like in your travel where there's, there's a uh, compression on both sides of it, or I guess there's rebound and compression. <laughs> but there's like there's two forces like pushing and pulling to make your your fork move essentially and you can speed up and slow down how each of those um portions of the bike move so if you're riding your bike per se and you feel like you're uh just getting like pogoed around like the rear end just like like it can't stay on the ground or whatever your rebound on your rear shock might be too fast and most of the time there will be um a kind of like little thing that's telling you you can add or reduce speed to your rebound um and you can usually just like turn the knobs every unfortunately piece of suspension has like some of them you need tools to adjust some of them are just a hand adjustment um, some of them it says <laughs> uh, which direction is which and some of them it doesn't so it's kind of hard to give like a general like this is how you'll always do it um, but on my bike there's like a little collar and it has a tortoise and a hair so you know you're slowing it down or speeding it up and if I'm hitting like jumps or something and I feel my bike feels a little pogo sticky and I know that I have my air pressure correct and my sag set correctly, then I know that maybe I wanna manipulate my, my rebound a little bit. Um, additionally, like um, if you, for on the opposite side of things, uh, the rebound is usually good to adjust if you're feeling like it's super bouncy and stuff like that. Um, but if you're per se like um, riding through a berm and you're kind of like pushing the bike into the berm and you're feeling like it's not supporting you. But again, you know, you have your sag set up well and you're kind of feeling like it's collapsing or like you're kind of like jolty, like your timing's off with that kind of stuff. Or if you hit like a compression and you get like this weird reaction from your bike, you can then um, adjust the amount of compression, um, which will kind of help support you more in berms like that. And usually i wouldn't like adjust it like two or three clicks at a time in both directions there's a lot more that goes into that um but it can be honestly like really confusing and you can end up just being like i don't even know what feels like what anymore <laughs> but uh lots of people say one click at a time i feel like sometimes one click is like not enough to have a noticeable distant difference so i like to do three clicks and then if i like it awesome maybe i'll keep it maybe i'll dial it back one click um, if I don't like it, I can just go back three clicks to my base setting and I can try one click always, but I always like to do just three. So it's like a noticeable um, impact to the way that the bike should feel. Um, and honestly, like it really does change the way a bike rides entirely. Um, if you start messing with a lot of these things or if you don't have them like set up super well and uh, your bike can feel like scary, like it's going to buck you off all the time and like it's not supportive in rock gardens or um, just like not super stable or, or like you don't have a lot of traction and then if you make sure that you always have your sag set up right and then can kind of start working on some of the other things like slowly and just doing it as a test run i think like there's so many things out there that'll tell you exactly how to run it um but like you can kind of figure it out for yourself which is, i think is really cool um most bike manufacturers if you buy a super modern bike um will give you some kind of like calculator or way to determine what you should run um different suspension companies also will so you can put in like if i'm running 152 psi in one of my pieces of suspension um and i i'm riding this bike like you can find a calculator that'll tell you, you should be four clicks from closed on your rebound <laughs> or things like that um so you can always use the recommended uh settings that the factories will produce as well as a starting point they're usually pretty accurate like um to what most people like to ride but everybody has different preferences um i i run my suspension in a very specific way and i only figured that out from riding it the wrong way a lot until i messed with it until i figured out and liked it so 
Um, does anybody have questions about any of that? I know that it was like quite the word vomit. It was, it was a lot of information. No? Know more about suspension than I did. I'm like, oh, I should probably go and get my bike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I I wish that you all were here longer when you were here recently because I was like, we could have ridden bikes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, so, I know. But next time, yeah. next time. Um, yeah, suspension yeah. is like I think one of the things that it's a little like it's not per se super gatekeepy, but like a lot of the information out there is like very technical and it's like yeah I'll watch a 30 minute video about how to set up my bike but like I don't think that anybody should have to do that to enjoy riding bikes um and I think right. that you know just like getting your your general sag set up correctly like even if you can't find like or don't know what kind of bike you ride or something like those numbers are general and work for most setups and definitely won't hurt you <laughs> to run something similar to that um, in uh, like 90% of scenarios. And it really just will like, there's nothing worse than like getting on a bike that's not set up for you really well. If you ever travel and like rent a bike and they don't set it up for you, it like, it is the worst. <laughs> like, and, and if you're used to one thing, like it can definitely feel different. So I think that it's really empowering to like know enough to like get your, sh your stuff done. But I also like, I'm to the point where sometimes I feel like everybody acts like you have to be like a professional bike mechanic to enjoy your bike. And that's yeah. just not the case. It's not no, the case at all. That's why bikes. professional bike mechanics exist. And, you know, I know how to work on a lot of my bikes and it's mostly just because I have so many of them. Like it, I I'd need to know how to work on them, but um, yeah. I just think that you should know how to get yourself out of a pickle, like how to fix a flat. You should know that like your multi-tool has like all of the, the right bits and pieces that you need to fix the things on your bike. Um, just because different bikes also have like different bolts and stuff here and there. Um, for the record, in case anybody was wondering, my like go-to multi-tool to tell people to get, if, especially if you don't have like a toolkit or anything at home is the M20 um, from Crank Brothers. Especially if you're running like tubeless tires, the M20 does come with like a bacon strip tool as well, which is useful for tubeless. Um, at, Evan, you might not know what bacon strip tools are. <laughs> so um, essentially if you're running a bike setup without tubes, you just have like a sticky substance inside and in the event that you like puncture your tire, you're truly puncturing the tire, you're not puncturing the tube inside. And you can fix it a lot of the times by jamming these little rubber strips into the hole. Um, and so you have like a tool that has like kind of like a fork sort of situation on it like this. And then you have like a little case of a bunch of pieces of rubber. Um, and so if you get a puncture, you can jam the rubber in there. It stays in the wheel and then you can just reinflate the wheel and usually get yourself back to the car at least. Um, if not, like I have ridden bacon for extended periods of time. I just usually trim it so it's like flush with the tire so it's not gonna rip out. Um, but this is a super great tool. It comes with a little cover that carries the things. The M19 that doesn't have the bacon strip tool is great if you're not running tubeless tires. Um, it's heavier, but I'm not weight weenie. So I just like to have to know that I always have everything I could need. Um, this has, uh, this little nifty thing is like a chain tool. If you needed to break your chain, um, there's like little different fittings on all sides of it for, um, for your valve core. There's a, a rotor truing little bit, which is like, if one of your brake rotors gets bent, you can kind of true it back into place. Um, this side has the correct feeding for every uh, little spoke. When If you're gonna try to tighten down the spokes on your wheels, there's like three typically standard sizes. And this one, um, this little piece here fits all of them. And then you have all of your normal, just like Allen keys, the torques that are common, a flat um, thing. And honestly, just works really well. I've never, I've never like gotten like broken something and then not had the right tool that I needed with this one. So I'm a big fan. I have a couple of them, but really any multi-tool will, will usually do. Most of them are pretty, pretty helpful. It's just totally up to preference on things uh, as far as that one goes. But 
Um, yeah, so things you should get, Evan, you should get one of these. If you don't have one, you should get one of these. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, cause so I got this bike from this uh, older woman in town and she's letting me like pay it off like over the summer. And she had one that she oh, gave me, but I didn't know what it was. I thought it was for <laughs> tires. So that's great. This has been super, um, informative for me and I'm probably going to go get my suspension looked at before I fuck with it yeah Um, it it doesn't take very long for them to help help you set it up like like you watched me just check mine in two minutes and obviously it's set up correctly because I set it up (laughs) Um, but like if not like it doesn't take that much longer if it was off I would have just screwed this on and like pumped a little and made it work you know so Yeah. It's a simple fix for a, a big improvement on the way it feels. Yeah. But, cool. Well, does anyone have any last minute questions? I have a random question. Totally. Um, do you, what are your thoughts on internal gear hubs? <laughs> do you have um, any experience with them? Like, uh, just to be clear that I'm speaking to the right thing, like a gearbox bike or like a bike that has like an internally geared rear hub, the internally geared rear hub. Um, I think they're kind of fun. Um, I've never seen one on like a, I don't want to say serious, but like a, on a, like a serious mountain bike. I've always, my only experience with in, internal um hubs is predominantly on like fixie bikes or or more like kind of like towny bikes um Hmm. personally um they're really cool they're fun if you like really obscure bikes my friend just built a single speed mountain bike with a coaster brake so um you know like you pedal backwards to brake instead of having actual (laughs) brakes on your bike um, which I think is horrifying for mountain biking, but he makes it fun. So that's good. And it has, it's like a single speed. It looks like a single speed, but it has an internally geared hub and, you know, it functions well. Um, if you're like really big on at home service, you kind of have your work cut out for you. There are a lot more effort to work on, um, mm. the event that they fail and stuff like that. Um, but they're cool. They're cool. Yeah. They're fun. <laughs> uh, sure. um, I you just know. randomly got on a wormhole of looking at them online and specifically <laughs> mountain bike ones that have it. But that's also what I've heard is if you want to do a lot of at home maintenance, that it's pretty tough because you have to really get in there. Yeah. The, and the, like gearbox bikes, which, you know, are honestly very similar. Um, and they kind of, we're trying to take over, I feel like a couple of years ago in the general like bike industry. Um, mm-hmm. They also work really well. And the truth is that you'll like, you know, you'll never break a derailleur hanger or anything with, with a gear right. bike, but the entire bike's design has to be built around that idea, which right now, like, it, it's just a total change and pivot in the industry. And it's kind of like a money suck. So they're really mm-hmm. cool. They work really well ultimately like they're just always going to probably be like a niche thing that like people who really geek out over their equipment like and other people who you know aren't like the most mechanically sound or stuff like that like because there's I mean there's shops that won't work on them like there's lots of bike yeah. shops that just be like I don't know how to do that I can't do that um you know like uh I have brakes that aren't like that obscure but like they are a Europe like a UK brand and like Mm -hmm. most of my local bike shops don't have the right tool to even do a brake bleed on my bike. So when (laughs) you get like a little weird, um, you kind of have to, you have to take a little bit more responsibility for the maintenance of, of the, (laughs) the thing that you add on there. But I mean, I'm all for it. If it like, if it's something you're super into, I think that they're really cool and they can be really cool. It's, it's cool all the different technology that we have to make bikes go at this point so yeah it seems very cool I don't know if I would ever get one but I yeah yeah. it's the kind (laughs) of thing I put on like um like on probably yeah like my around town bike or something because like or like a a gravel bike or something because I'm all for making weird gravel bikes but I I love 
Like, <laughs> I, I love graveling. I do a lot of it these days. So if anybody on this call is in the Reno Tahoe area, I don't know where you are, Macy, but um, there's gravel race on Saturday and it's going to be really fun. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I'm up in Bend, but I do frequent okay. Tahoe uh, pretty, pretty often. I used to live there before Bend. So oh, nice. Yeah, yeah Bend, Bend's awesome for bikes. I love Bend. Yeah, it's there's a huge community here, and um, yeah, I love it. Radical. Does anybody have any other questions? Thanks for hanging out with me. Thank you. Thank this you. is really great. So much good information. Truly. Yeah, <laughs> it's learn um, about those screws. Yep. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um. I, I'm glad we talked about it. I would have felt so bad if I was like, don't let anything be loose on your bike. And you just totally like yarded on a bunch of things that shouldn't have yeah. <laughs> um, but, but okay, no, no. if anybody has any bike questions, um, I'm in the clubhouse. You can find me on Instagram. I'm rather be wrecking. Um, I run a nonprofit bike team slash community. Um, cause we aren't only racing. We do a lot of community events. Um, and we also have a page. So we're loose program racing. Um, we're, uh, by women for everyone, uh, which is funny because, uh, the founders are women, but we're also gay. So it makes it extra funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we, we do all, all types of bike racing. Um, it's not just mountain bikes, but, um, uh, do specialize in, and mountain biking, gravel racing, and, and road racing. So if you ever have any questions about like wanting to race or, or bike questions or those kind of things, like we have a whole community that we've built around and entirely just kind of like breaking down those barriers. Cause like, it can be really scary to be like, I don't even know what to tell the bike shop I need to do to fix my bike, but I know that something's wrong. And we just want to like empower people to not feel that way. And then also feel like, you know, they deserve to be in our space because we, we want more people in our space. We want less old white men in the space. They honestly, yeah. really kill the vibe. they kill the vibe so hard. Oh yeah. I um, have a real interesting old white man thing on my ride today. And I was like, all right. <laughs> we just lost Hannah. Oh. oh no. I don't know where she went. Let me text her. Well, hello, well. you two. <laughs> hey. Hey. How's, um, how's the bike instructing going? Yeah. It is a lot of fun. It is an exhausting job, but, but yeah, it's, it's cool. I like it. Yeah. That's awesome. That, it sounds fun. It just sounds, it, yeah, it sounds like a lot physically, uh, to do all the time or however many days a week you're doing it. Yeah, I'm, I'm full time and like, you know, we work closely with the patrol. Like we wear the same uniforms that says bike patrol, but if you get hurt, like don't ask me. Um, <laughs> I can radio someone, but but I can't help you. But like, we'll have to do like trail checks in the morning. So have to like do a full on ride and then like do sweeps in the afternoon. So another full ride and like, always forget how long the trails are until you're on them and you're just still going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The two full rides a day too. That's, I mean, on top of also the stuff you're doing in the middle. That's a lot. Yeah. Well, I feel like his phone died because she didn't text me back. So I think her phone died because I think she was doing the call on her phone. Um, but I hope we all got questions answered. Um, this recording is going to go in the clubhouse and then she's going to do a little follow-up doc on there and we'll put her, um, the nonprofit that she started the bike group, um, in there. So yeah. Um, thank you both for coming. This was really, I, I enjoyed it and, um, yeah. I'm glad that you two are here. Thanks for hosting and tell thank Hannah, you. Tell Hannah I say yeah. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell her she'll probably text me and be like my phone died um yeah cool well I'll see you both in the clubhouse and um enjoy your week and I hope you get out on bikes I know you will Nia <laughs> and you too probably yeah yeah okay Bye. Cool. Well, thanks Bye. for coming